everybody, Realm Builder Guy here, and welcome to a new Crusader Kings 3 guide. And, you know, I put that short one out on Chola, on the Chola Empire, and uh, kind of asked, you know, do you want long form or shorter ones? And the majority said we really like the longer longer guides and uh, so congratulations i'm going to give you france today so it's probably going to be a little bit longer but i do occasionally want to do some of those shorter ones as well because there are certain countries or people that don't fit into a mass regional overview um an example would be Brittany. i don't want to lump them in with france because i just want to focus on the actual country of france in this one so let's dive right into france so in the 1066 start we've got king philippe the first of france on the throne he's only 14 years old his primary heir is his younger brother, Hugh of France. He's 14, he has one claim, and other than that, all of his title. He's, of course, Capetian. And uh, let's go through a little bit of the historical background, of course, first for King Philip, and then the Capets in general. So King Philippe was known as the Amorous, and he actually, he married Bertha of Holland in 1072. And the reason why he's known as the Amorous is because he repudiated her, which is a nice way of saying, I don't want to be with you, for love. And his love happened to be Bertrade de Montfort, who was the wife of the Duke of Anjou. So needless to say, that added some complications. And because of this affair, he was actually excommunicated, excommunicated sorry, twice. Um, the last one actually was first was by a bishop, local bishop, and then Pope Urban himself at the Council of Clermont in 1095 excommunicated him. And this is, of course, the council that led to the First Crusade. Now, King Philippe kind of supported that crusade, but it was really his younger brother, who we see here, Hugh, uh, who was more active in the crusade himself. Uh, King Philippe actually died in 1108. Uh, but aside from his amorous affairs, there wasn't much else big about him. The, the biggest problem he had was obviously dealing with all the power-hungry vassals that we will get into today. Now, the Capet House dynasty, or the Capetians, they came to power in the year 987 when Hugh Capet became the King of France via election after the death of the last Carolingian king. Um, they reigned directly until the year 1328, but because they had no heirs, no male heirs after that time, it went to a cadet branch named the Valois, who then lost power in 1589 to another Capetian cadet branch, the Bourbon, who then were the last line of French kings. So unlike other countries where you have multiple dynasties, it's really the Capets reigned either directly or through a cadet branch for most of the history of France. I mean, we're looking at until I think it was 1848 when they finally dissolved the uh, French royal house. Uh, and so it was from 987 until then. It's a long time to have this kind of influence. Uh, and before that, it was the Carolingians. So that is King Philippe. Now, what do you have to do if you want to be a king? Now, this isn't really a start that I choose just because, you know, you may think it's easy, but it's actually not. You got a lot going on. But what you want to do is, of course, you need to neutralize some of your powerful uh, vassals. One of the most annoying ones being William the Bastard of Normandy, who I will get into. But after that, you're also looking at maybe conquering Brittany making sure you're strong against the Holy Roman Empire. So building some alliances here along your eastern border is very important. And then keeping an eye to the south. See how things go in Iberia. Uh, the Reconquista has started down there, maybe supporting Barcelona. That would be kind of a natural, um, a natural alliance there as well as Navarre. So those are some of the things to keep in mind if you are Philippe. Of course, you're 14. You need to get married. You need to have kids. Um, 
If you want to keep Philippe on the throne, of course, there are there is an heir in his younger brother. Uh, but, uh, you know, you've got really a ton of opportunities there, including, you know, being amorous, if you so choose, or going a completely different route with Philippe. Now, to start looking at the vassals, we're going to start to the north in one of the most powerful ones in the Duke of Flanders, Bodvein V, Bodvein Zun of Flanders. Uh, he is actually married to a Capet in Adele, who has multiple pressed claims. So that means children would technically inherit those claims. Um, he doesn't, but that's, I believe, from a different marriage. But that's just something to keep in mind. He also has his daughter is married to none other than William of Normandy. And his half-sister is actually married to a Godwin, Tostig Godwinson, whose brother is King Harold of England. And that kind of leads me into the the historical part of it. Not only were the Dukes of Flanders very, very powerful, but Bodwein V in particular was involved deeply in English politics, not just through the marriages of daughter and said half-sister, but he was actually a foreign policy advisor to Edward the Confessor when they were looking for heirs in a line of succession. So he, you know, kind of played both sides in this that on the one hand he was close to William, but on the other hand he kind of helped out with King Harold as well, um, and try to find the right person to follow Edward the Confessor. Now, if we look at the Flanders beyond him, House Flanders is an old house, started in the 10th century, and lasted quite a long time. Uh, most notable things that they did in the Fourth Crusade, the House of Flanders established the Latin Crusader Empire of Constantinople, and a cadet branch from them actually formed the First Kingdom of Jerusalem. So, what could you do here with Mr. Bodvin? Well, obviously, you're going to play the England game. Be involved there because you're already close with both Normandy and, uh, honestly, King Harold as well. Now, internally, what you'll want to do is actually, I would say you want Normandy to extend into England so you can build strong alliances here and start gobbling up some of your smaller neighbors. You may also want to look at pressing uh, or pushing some claims into the Holy Roman Empire because Flanders did historically straddle both borders quite often. Uh, the other thing you may want to look at historically, why not? Once crusades happen, join them and establish some the kingdom of Jerusalem or the Latin Empire of Constantinople as the House Flanders. Now, Bodwin will probably not do it. He's 54 years old. His wife is 57. So you're not going to have any more kids with her. You may want to look at, you know, finding someone else. But in the meantime, you do have heirs um following you one is obviously uh this the count of Eno, and you can see Eno is actually in the holy roman empire so uh that's one direction this can go and then you have the count of zeland who is just to the north of you also in the holy roman empire so the goal here would be to eventually bring all of the lowlands together and maybe form your own independent realm that way now, of course, we have to talk about William the Bastard, William II, the Bastard of Normandy. Um, and he's a legitimated bastard uh, through his father, Duke Robert the Magnificent of Normandy. His grandfather was Duke Richard the Good of Normandy. And those are all important uh, people in the story that I am going to weave here. Now, I'm gonna, not going to go through all the history of William the Conqueror. It's very well known and you can read up on it. I recommend reading the books from Dan Jones. I have all of his books. Uh, the Plantagenets is one of my favorites. Now, obviously, Plantagenets follow the Normandies, uh, the, Nor the House of Normandy, but it's still something I highly recommend. So, Duke William the Conqueror is actually a direct descendant of the Viking conqueror Rollo, who is in the TV show Vikings and is erroneously depicted as Ragnar Lothbrok's brother, which he was not historically. Because Rollo actually existed, Ragnar still disputed whether or not he actually existed. 
So what I want to talk about is more the conquest of England. I have played this game now quite often and checked to see what happens with England. Now, William almost always overthrows King Harold of England, Harold Godwinson. But then he is in turn pushed out, oftentimes, more than half the time, by the King of Norway, who has superior forces. So you're going to need to build alliances. Now, the nice thing is you got a ton of kids they can start building alliances with. Maybe look and see what Brittany can do for you. Maybe look and see what Flanders can do for you. It's kind of a shame that this alliance isn't hard-coded into the game. I think it should have been, given that uh, you are married to the daughter of the Duke of Flanders. I think that would just make sense. But anyway, you do have a pressed claim for England, so that means it would technically go to your children. But how did that claim happen? And this is kind of the history that I want to get into. So Edward the Confessor needed an heir, and he was looking around and seeing who he could find. And he exiled Godwin, Earl of Wessex, in 1051, and then called William, this is, this is what the Normans claim, to his court, and named him the heir, because Godwin would have been technically the next logical-ish in line, but he said, I don't like this guy. He's too powerful. I want you, William. Then William went back to France and in 1064 tried to conquer Brittany with the support of Harold, who had inherited the earldom of Wessex from his father Godwin in the meantime. And Harold supposedly swore to uphold William's claim to the English throne. Now, no English records exist of either Edward the Confessor naming William or Harold Godwinson saying that he would support that claim. Norman Chronicles do say that, but they also say that Harold does get named king by Edward the Confessor when Edward dies in 1066. Harold's claim comes via Knut the Great, who was married to Edward's aunt. William's claim comes through... Uh, one uh, through an uncle from Edward the Confessor, Richard II of Normandy. So it's around multiple uh, angles. You could also make a claim for uh, the Scottish king having right claim to the throne as well as the Danish king because of the descendants from Knut and so on. But anyway, so Harold was named king by Edward supposedly on his deathbed. His last, final words were, Harold, you are going to be king of England because Harold was there. Now, obviously, we don't know exactly what happened. And the Normans actually acknowledged that Edward the Confessor named Harold to be the next king of England. So I think we can say that that was Edward's wish. But because the Norman chronicles say that Edward named William first, and Harold said he would support William's claim in 1064, that those promises superseded Edward's deathbed um, proclamation as Harold being the king. And that's why William has the justification, supposedly, to go into this war. I'm not going to go into the machinations for this war, but if you're going to be William, and you want to become king of England, allies, allies, allies. You've got a lot of money, 636. Bring in mercenaries because England will, Harold will lose this war. He cannot battle both uh, William and Norway at the same time. I've seen them lose 100% of the time. But then if you are William and you've conquered southern England, you're going to face off with a powerful Norway. So getting allies is very key. One ally could maybe be Scotland because then they will occupy the Norwegians to the north. The others could be maybe the Welsh, someone in Ireland, Brittany, Flanders, or just anybody else, really. You need allies. You don't have any at this time, but you have plenty of children that you can form alliances with and, you know, use some of that money, bring in some mercenaries and really bolster your troops. So that is William the Conqueror. 
Next, we're going to go just to the south of Normandy and talk about the battling brothers of Anjou. And these are Count Geoffrey of Anjou and Count Fulk of Touraine. Now, these are two historical characters who hated each other. I mean, they were brothers, but, you know, anyway. Geoffrey was excommunicated, as is shown here, and that is hard-coded. And he was actually excommunicated because of a row with the local archbishop who he tried to kick out of office. So the archbishop said, no, I'm excommunicating you. So that's where that comes from. Now, Geoffrey is known historically as being mildly incompetent. And because of that, his brother, who he had ousted, Count Folk, who has a claim on the Duchy of Anjou, which, by the way, you'll notice here, he does not have that claim. So Folk does have that claim. Now, Folk was like, no, this is mine. I need to get rid of my brother. He constantly, constantly fought wars against each other in 1067. Folk actually defeated Joffrey, imprisoned him, but then had to let him go again. Joffrey raised an army again, attacked Anjou, who was now under the control of Folk. Uh, lost that one as well because he's such an incompetent military leader. And Folk then had him finally in prison for 28 years until he was freed by Pope Urban II in 1096, uh, shortly after which... Um, he then died. So Joffrey, kind of a, uh, I mean, you can see here his attributes, not that great. His brother, significantly better. I've opened this a few times and he's had these in here. So he's a, a strong military capable leader. And Folk spent most of his time trying to rebuild the Duchy of Anjou. So that meant he was in wars against Normandy, Montague, and Aquitaine almost nonstop. Um, he was not very well liked. Um, in fact, in uh, the chronicles from contemporaries of that time, he was described as rude, sullen, and surly. So what do you do here? So if you are incompetent Jeffrey, um, which that's a tough one uh, because, I mean, you have 282 troops. Uh, your brother is the most likely one you're going to want to battle with uh because you're very you're you're slightly more powerful apologize apologies for that um even though he is the superior military leader you're in a very difficult position as jeffrey now if you want to go as folk go full in for anjou press your claims and build up some allies now both of these guys have no kids and they're not married so the interesting thing is the brother on each side is the primary heir. So if you're going to be Folk or Jeffrey, the natural direction you want to go is murder your brother. Um, chances are a little bit higher for Folk because he has higher intrigue, but that is the direction I would go before going into full-on warfare. It is honestly for Jeffrey the most likely play. Either way, you're going to want to get married. You need to produce heirs. You need to produce alliances. Aquitaine is going to be difficult because you're just a count, and that is a duke. Look for another count to help you out. Uh, Barry would be a very good one. They're pretty strong. Montague, also very strong. So those are the battling brothers of Anjou. Now, if we move south of those malcontents, uh, we actually have, just as a side note, uh, Emery of Montague. He was close friends with William the Conqueror and actually went and fought in England with William. So maybe that's a natural ally if you want to play that uh, little bit of a history game. But uh, we're going to look at Guillaume, or William, the eighth of Aquitaine. And actually, we're going to skip past him. He wasn't really known as... Well, he wasn't really that well known. You can see he's got some issues with his liege. But we're going to go here to Lusignan. And we're going to talk about Hugh of Lusignan, who's known as the Devil. Now, Hugh, the Devil of Lusignan, he was called Devil due to a violent conflict with one particular abbey, the Abbey of saint Maxon, And it was only stopped when the Pope threatened to excommunicate Hugh. And the monks at the abbey gave him the name the devil now what he's most famous for is actually in the crusades he was a very pious devout christian and so uh when there were calls to arms 
for a crusade. He was right there with everybody else. First in 1087, he heads south to Spain to support. Uh, we got him right here. Where is he? Where is he? There we go. Ram, uh, Ramon of Barcelona. So one of his half-brothers to support him because, uh, well, the Muslims of Iberia were threatening Barcelona, so he went there first. Then he joined the First Crusade and actually died in 1102 at the Battle of Ramla. Now, the only reason why I picked him is because, well, anybody called the devil makes it interesting. He's actually relatively average. You can see he's got good learning. He's a mastermind philosopher. And I've had that a few times now on, uh, on Reload. But uh, it's because, well, the name and his family. He has so many half-siblings. He's got um, a count down here. Then he's got uh, the Duke of Toulouse, the another... Uh, in the family of Toulouse as well, and then, of course, in Barcelona. So it makes for an interesting play. Now, what you're going to do, it's Hugh, is try to go after some of your neighbors. Now, as you can see here, not a ton of troops. So you're going to want to ally. You have one child. You are married. You're 27. Get more children and play the alliance game to start building up your power there and investing money uh, into developing your province as well to build up your levies and become more powerful that way. Eat up Aquitaine from the inside out is basically what I'm saying. And then if you want to go historical, join a crusade, go to the Holy Land and see what you can do as Hugh the Devil of Lucian. Next up, we are going to Duke Guillaume or William the Fourth of Toulouse. Now, he's not a major historical force, and he actually died in the Holy Land, and he gave his brother, who is his heir, Raymond, the, um, I guess, guardianship of Toulouse in his absence. It was pilgrimage. It was prior to the First Crusade, and he died out there. Uh, and then Raymond took over, and we will talk about Raymond here in a second. What uh, Guillaume, uh, or what William, however you want to call him, what this this house is known for is it produced one of the most famous women of the middle ages in Eleanor of Aquitaine, who is the great granddaughter of William the fourth and thereby also the granddaughter of his eventual heir, Count Raymond, who we will talk about now. Raymond of Rouergue. If I'm mispronouncing that, then I am sorry. And Raymond was significantly better known and more competent and stronger than his brother. You can see he's got a few claims in and around him, including the Duchy of Toulouse. Now, uh, Raymond took over for his brother after his brother, brother died in the Holy Land. He was deeply religious and he was famous as a crusader. So once the crusade got announced, he joined right away. He was famous for leading the siege of Antioch. And he was then actually offered the crown of the kingdom of Jerusalem and refused it because he found it repugnant to rule the city where Jesus died. He just, it made him feel uncomfortable. His life goal was to establish his own independent nation around the city of Tripoli. In 1105, he died once again on crusade. He never really came back to France. He didn't let his sister who pleaded with him that she should take over the Regency of Toulouse. He said no. He stayed in the Holy Land, and he actually died and still did not capture Tripoli. So that's a little bit sad there. So what can you do as Count Raymond? So he is a strong military leader. He is zealous as well. Quite a few claims. Now, if you want to play this historically accurate, you're going to be loyal to your brother and, you know, that's that's one way to go and hope he just dies of natural causes. He has no children, but neither do you. So make sure children come about quickly. You're only 17 years old, so you have plenty of time. Well, you can still play the game internally. Press your claims for uh, the neighboring uh, county of Kersi. So you can already expand your holdings there and just become the most powerful vassal within Toulouse. And eventually you can take that over as well. Once the... Crusades come out, go for it. Go there, whether it's down to Iberia. This could be a very interesting play for you to expand here. Or, of course, heading over to Jerusalem. 
I find this guy very, very intriguing. He's got a pretty good amount of prestige already and a decent level of piety. Uh, very strong martial skills. And I reloaded it twice, and he seems to have the same stuff over and over again. So um, that's the route I would go with him. Is definitely military conquest, not intrigue, not killing your brother. But again, everybody can play this game however they choose. But if you want to play it historically accurate-ish, that's one way to go. But again... You don't have any children, so you want to make sure you get a few heirs there. Next up in France, we're going to go to Duke Robert Robert the second, the old of France, from the House Bourgogne, or the House of Burgundy. Now, he is the Duke of Burgundy. He has no claims anywhere else, but he is a person of renown. He was actually the son of King Robert of France and the brother to King Henry of France. So he is, it is a Capetian cadet branch that he actually founded he was the founder of the house burgundy which ended in 1383 as the main branch in portugal um but there were two other cadet branches from the house of burgundy the houses of aviz and uh, braganza that ruled in portugal and brazil until 1910 or 1888 respectively so it actually he shifted to Portugal from this house. Now, he himself was known as a robber baron, especially stealing from his own vassals. And in 1048, you'll notice something here, Kinslayer, yep, he murdered the entire family of his ex-wife. So, that happened. Uh, his sister is married to the Duke of Flanders. Uh, other than that, uh, he has no direct claim to the throne, which is interesting that he doesn't have claims, but his sister does, uh, even though he is a descendant from a king of France. So what are the ways you can play him? Well, historically accurate. I mean, 438, uh, Ozer have 509, is you start slowly but surely expanding uh, and gobbling up your neighbors and building a kingdom of Burgundy. Why not become independent? You're kind of a prick, uh, but a very powerful one. Uh, he's 55 years old. He's got plenty of children, so you don't have to worry about that. Play the alliance game there as well. You still have some that are un unmarried or unbetrothed, so uh, that would be a direction to go there. I wouldn't worry about the Holy Land with him at least, maybe with uh, his heirs. But expanding within France and maybe using that crown, that, that nugget of a storyline, a narrative that you, you should have a claim on the kingdom of France. And maybe that is your drive to go there at all cost, completely ruthless, murdering, burning, pillaging, and fighting your way to either create the kingdom of Burgundy or honestly become the king of France, you or your heir. So that is Duke Robert of Burgundy. So for the final one, we're going to go just to the southwest of Burgundy to the county of Bourbon. And this is Count Achambault of Bourbon of House Bourbon. No major titles or anything like that. The interesting thing here is just the story behind this house. Now, this is the first house of Bourbon, which ended in 1196 when Archambault the seventh uh, only had a daughter, Mathilde, who then married Guy II of Dampierre, who then had a son called Archambault the eighth, and he then founded the second house of Bourbon. But what you can say there, obviously, is it is still a direct link to the House of Bourbon. But because it was not a matrilineal marriage like you can do here in CK3, it basically had to be reestablished. And this is, of course, the Bourbon House, a cadet branch, supposedly, of the Capetians. But it followed the Capetians to the throne of France in 1589, and the House of Bourbon is the famous one that led France from 1589 until the dissolution of the monarchy in 1848. So we're thinking Louis XIV, Louis XVI, and so on. So this is the seed of that house. So how do you play this? You're not a powerful county. Um, some of your neighbors have significantly larger holdings and larger military than you 386. Now, the nice thing is 
you've got a few kids, none of which are betrothed or married. So play the alliance game. That is your way to grow. Get powerful allies and then start picking off some of these other counts around you. Uh, Burgundy may not be a bad one to go after there, aforementioned, or over here in Tiberi, and then uh, maybe also look at Orzea. And so you're slowly building your power base here in France. And obviously, as a Bourbon, the, the natural inclination as far as a narrative for him would be to go after to become the king of France. Now, that's not the storyline I have with everybody that I mentioned here. I mean, William going for England, you know, uh, Lusignan is going more for the Holy Land, as is the House of Toulouse. Burgundy, on the other hand, aggressively wanting the kingdom of France, and Bourbon eventually gets there. So maybe through the marriage game, instead of the conquest game, maybe more marriage and intrigue is the way to get the House Bourbon built up there. Also playing to the strengths of your uh, current leader. So there you have that. So that is my guide to France here in this 1066 start here at the beginning of CK3. Um, probably going to look at France again as we get other times in history where we can start and maybe also look at it if there is a post Stamford Bridge um, battle where... William is established as King of England and see where the power then lays in France. But until that time, this is Realm Builder Guy. Don't forget to hit the like button. Subscribe if you're new, not to miss anything out. And let me know in the comments if you've done anything in France yet and how that's gone and maybe one of the characters that I mentioned here today. So until next time, I'm Realm Builder Guy, and I'll talk to you soon.